morning. How many of you realize that homunculi are next? Okay, I'm here to fix that. Okay, uh, we need a definition. That's a human. There's a millihuman, a microhuman, and a nanohuman. They are all homunculi, which are miniature representations of real humans. So there are a couple hundred scientists, physicians, and engineers worldwide trying to build homunculi, and you might wonder why. Human biology is very complex. I want to show you how complex biology is, just a little bit of it. And homunculi are going to help us understand physiology. They're going to help us improve drug development. And they're also going to help us advance environmental toxicology. So raise your hand if you've ever had an adverse drug reaction or know someone who has. Wow. Come on. Earth to push button. OK. Do household cleaners, perfumes, chemicals, garden things, smog, pollution, how many of, that, of you are bothered by that? Homunculi will help you. That's why homunculi are next. OK, in order to understand why homunculi are useful, I need to take you into multidimensional phase space. It's a place where we can describe all the variables of human complexity, both in the homunculi and the people that are doing it. So the easiest definition of, homuncula, of, of phase space is to look at a swing. So as you swing back and forth, you may not realize you're exploring phase space. It's a geometrical space where each possible state of the system is represented by a single point. OK, so there's the swing. We have swing angle. And as you swing back and forth, in phase space, swing angle goes back and forth. But there are more variables. You need a dimension for each variable. So when you swing in a back and forth, you also have not just the angle, but the velocity. So let's go back here to the back porch and look at a swing. I can swing front to back. It's really easy. Everybody's done it. If you're good, you can pump sideways. That's a little harder. You can do both at once. That's swinging in a circle. And really good is you can wind it up. It's great fun, but a little disorienting. <laughs> so now if you go into phase space, here you see that I'm going in front back phase space, front back angle, front back velocity, everything's fine. If I want to go side to side, I have to add two more dimensions. I got to have the side angle and the side velocity. That's easy. Everybody happy with that? Now, if you do both at once, you can do that in the very same phase space because it's just a matter of the timing of the right, left, front, back. No problem. If you start twisting, you need yet two more dimensions of phase space, twist angle and twist velocity. So six-dimensional phase space is fun, and it's demonstration that you can do more than one thing at a time, probably with one quarter of the IQ. But, <laughs> but you can do things in phase space in multiple times, multiple things at a time. So biology is complex, and it's so complex that I can't explain it in 18 minutes. So let's just start with a simple list. You have more organs in your body than you would care to read about, and there happens to be a medical department for each organ group and a physician for each organ. Now, organs can talk to each other, and the reason we need homunculi is it's very hard to hear what organs are saying when they're talking to each other. So, the opposite of multitasking is silos. A silo is a place where you store stuff without mixing. Everybody's happy with that. Unfortunately, silo mentality is a place where you think without mixing. And homunculi are not going to work if you work in a silo mentality. So here we have thyroid, pituitary, eyes, ears, skin, intestines. I want to focus, just for the convenience, on five organs, blood, lung, brain, lungs, kidney, heart, and liver. So, Suppose that you have a problem with one of those organs. You're going to have to take a drug, and the question you can ask is, how was that drug tested? Today, drugs are tested by the pharmaceutical industry and physicians 
initially with petri dishes, then mice and humans. So let's start with the petri dish. So what do you put in the petri dish? You look at the organs from a silo mentality, you shrink the organs into petri dishes and you now have brain cells, heart cells, liver cells, kidney cells in your petri dishes. The petri dishes aren't talking to each other. So you want to test the drug, you put the drug in each petri dish. Drop the drug in it, it bounces, it dissolves, and if the cells don't complain, you say, great, this drug doesn't hurt the organs, and this is again organ as it was a petri dish. So once that's done, you say, great, now let's move on to mice. Move on to mice, please. Thank you. Okay, so what does it mean to test a drug in a mouse? You shove the drug into the mouse, if the mouse smiles, you say, ah. <laughs> the mouse is happy with the drug, go on to people. Great. Next step, test the drug on people. So we take our human, we put the drug in it, it dissolves, everything's going fine until something goes wrong and you now have a problem with a human. You say, how could this have happened? It's already passed all of our drug tests. Two things could have happened. Human genes are not mouse genes, so what bothers the human may not bother the mouse. And the petri dish, which could be done with human cells, they're not talking to each other. So if two organs are talking to each other and you don't find out about it until too late, you have a problem with developing pharmaceuticals. So the scientists and engineers and physicians working on homunculi say, great, we're going to slip homunculi between the mice and the humans. And if we do it right, we use less mice and we also kill fewer humans. So the, homunculus that, the homunculi that we are building happen to be alive and they are going to be built from human cells and will solve the problem of the mouse to human drug testing issues. So imagine you've built a homunculus and it's sitting here, it's got a heart that's beating, it has a lung that is breathing, it has a liver and a stomach. So what's the drug test? Drug test. There. Okay, you put the drug into the stomach, it dissolves. First thing it does is it ends up in the liver. Lo and behold, the liver has changed it into something else and that something else happens to kill the patient. So 40% of drugs fail because of cardio cardiac complications, cardiovascular compl complications. In this case, we have detected an unexpected human organ-to-organ -organ interaction, but the great advantage is no human dies. Then when you see there's something wrong, you can either change drugs or change the drug itself to avoid the problem. So, I think I've just explained why we're building homunculi. Biology is complex and we have a tool to solve a problem. Everybody okay? Okay. Now, how do you build it? You take some human cells and instead of an electronic chip, use a microfluidic chip, little tubes filled with water. And you make the human cells work like real organs in these little chips. You connect the organs together and that allows them to talk to each other. So the liver can talk to the lung and the brain can talk to the kidney. Um, the other thing that this allows you to do is lots of things are happening at the same time. So effectively, think in organ phase space because the organs are talking to each other in the time. So this is an elegant lung on the chip developed by a group at Harvard that I'm working with. This is mammary gland on a chip developed by colleagues at Vanderbilt to study breast cancer and treatment of breast cancer. This is kidney on a chip being developed by a group at University of California, San Francisco, Cleveland Clinic, and now Vanderbilt. This is T cells, immune cells, in a lymph node on a chip done by one of my group members. This is a brain on a chip that represents a consortium between Cleveland Clinic, Meharry Medical College, and Vanderbilt. Now that may not look like a really smart brain, but the key thing is it has, it has two chambers. On top, there's the chamber that has the neurons and the blood vessel, and on the bottom there's the chamber that has the cerebral vascular fluid. This is not a brain that's going to count. This is going to be a homunculus brain that will tell you whether a drug is crossing the blood-brain barrier or not, the major barrier for getting medications into the brain. So a group of people, including a project head by the uh, Los Alamos National Laboratory, we're building an advanced tissue-engineered human ectypal network analyzer. We call our chip Athena, not by coincidence. 
So we also call her a millihuman. She is going to be one thousandth of a human. And the millihuman species that I've named is Homo chippus. <laughs> and so welcome to Homo chippus. Now, it turns out that this Athena's going to have a left heart, a right heart, and a lung, going to have a liver and a kidney, and maybe a gut. Um, the key thing is Athena cannot live by herself, and so this is basically the hardware that provides Athena's life support. So one of the guys in the group has built the microcontroller for the electronic control of an organ, and this is what a really super organ on a chip is going to look like. So the other problem, though, I have about the problem of building something as complicated as a homunculus is you need special people to build homunculi. So what kind of people build homunculi? So we can look at the fields of knowledge. Everybody thinks of the fields of knowledge as, as, a, as a glorious field with all sorts of insights. In fact, what happens is they're really silos of knowledge. You have the humanities, the sciences, the engineers, the social sciences, the professions. And quite often, they don't always talk to each other. Some places are better at talking to each other, but really, these are silo disciplines with a silo mentality. Athena needs a mix of disciplines, so in fact, Athena needs intellectual phase space. It's not sufficient to say that you need to bring a biologist, an artist, and a chemist together. You have to have people that can speak more than one language. It's not necessarily multitasking, but you have to be able to move between disciplines because all of those disciplines are required to build this very complicated system. So, Ross introduced me as a plumber, a carpenter, and electrician. In fact, I tell my deans that I'm, in fact, an engineer, a physicist, and a physiologist because they don't need to know my hobbies. Um, <laughs> so, the key thing about phase space, you can be more than one thing at the same time. And that's not the same as multitasking. It says that you're not just a pure engineer or a pure physiologist. So if I look at intellectual phase space, I grew up as a physicist, and I think everyone has Albert Einstein as a remarkable model of a physicist. I also have remarkable regard for Richard Feynman and also Enrico Fermi. Now, the problem is that I'm way down here, at the bottom, and it's very difficult to be in a discipline that is defined by geniuses such as those men. And you can imagine it might lead to feelings of insecurity or even being an imposter. But we have to put up with that, but this is, this is physics phase space. Look at engineering. George Westinghouse, he invented the railroad air brake, and he also harnessed the hydropower of Niagara Falls to build the first commercially viable alternating electric current power system. He was really good. He was also an extraordinarily nice person and took great care of his employees. He benefited greatly from the inventions of Nikola Tesla. He bought te inventions from Tesla. Tesla is the wild man that built the Tesla coil that every high school student likes to play with. The Tesla car is named in his honor. And Richard Feynman could diagnose a radio by thinking about it. Enrico Fermi could build a nuclear reactor, though he really annoyed his wife because when their first winter moving from Italy to Chicago, he miscalculated whether they needed um, storm windows and she froze. And so he couldn't calculate everything, but he's still a bit of an engineer. And there's me, a little bit of a physicist and a little bit of an engineer. But you also need physiology to build homunculi, and I think the, the grandfather of all physiology is Galen of Pergamon practiced medicine for 70-some years in Greece, and so he is the defining edge, and there's a little bit of physiologist in me. But if you want somebody who is, <laughs> who is good at both engineering and physics, it's not Westinghouse, it's not Einstein, it turns out it's Emmett Brown of Back to the Future. <laughs> now, now, Einstein developed special relativity realizing what it would be like to ride a beam of light. Doc Brown simply built a DeLorean so he could ride on the beam of light. So a guy that can understand Einstein well enough to turn a DeLorean into a time machine is one hell of an engineer. And he's got to be good at physics. So Doc Brown is my hero in the engineering physics realm. 
But if you want somebody who's good at everything, who better than Leonardo da Vinci? Da Vinci understood uh, physiology. He dissected cadavers. He was a fantastic artist. But most importantly, in the 1400s, he could build a wooden helicopter. Now, a wooden helicopter in the 1400s is equivalent to a DeLorean time machine today. So da Vinci is really a very good, very good role model for all of us. So if we want to look at, though, this a little bit more carefully, let's just focus on Einstein and Doc Brown. <laughs> and ask yourself, what distinguishes Einstein from Doc Brown? OK, Einstein was a theorist, and Doc Brown was clearly an experimentalist. But there's more to the difference between the two. And for this, we go into behavioral phase space. Is everybody happy with phase space? OK. Nobody would argue that Einstein was focused, calm, questioning. Nobody would argue that Emmett Brown was creative, excited, and scattered. And you can see why I like Emmett Brown. So this is behavioral phase space. Now, if you look at the behaviors that are needed to build Athena, you basically look at, a <laughs> you look at behavioral silos. And some people have argued, but I haven't been able to concentrate long enough to understand whether they're right, that I might have ADHD. <laughs> But I happen to resent being put into an ADHD silo, and I would argue vociferously if someone says, oh, but you really need to be normal. Normal people don't do this. <laughs> now, the first time I assembled this slide, I said, oh my god, that's what my wife has been living with for 43 years. <laughs> Hats off to her. OK, I also remember as a kid being told, Johnny, don't run your swing sideways. Johnny, don't twist your swing up. And oh my god, don't run in orbits. The trouble is that being told that is not that different from being put in a silo. And I believe that true creativity, as needed to solve giant problems, either societal or homuncular, don't put people into a single silo and don't discourage the imagination and the curiosity that's needed to solve really hard problems. So I looked at my... I did an inventory of the five engineers that are working in my group on Athena, and I realized that we all share 17 or 18 behaviors. And that's because we are occupying phase space. Athena needs more than one dimension of behavioral phase space, as do many giant societal problems. So the last question is, is what are we learning? We go into genetic phase space. This is the albumin gene. You really hope that it's working in your liver. It's not that it is there, but it has to be working. It has to have the correct expression level. You also have the albumin gene elsewhere in your body, but the gene is dependent upon the organ. This is the gene for a transporter in the lung, if you have it of the right flavor and the right amount, you breathe fine. If you don't, you have cystic fibrosis. This is the gene for a filter in the kidney. If you have it in the kidney in the right amount of the right time, you're fine. Otherwise, you have kidney failure. There's 12 gene phase space, 100 gene phase space, more genes than you can care to count, 1,000 gene phase space, 20,000 gene phase space. You can have an awful lot of fun in 20,000 gene phase space. The key thing that's the important lesson for the homunculi and us in general is the gene expression in each organ is different. And the organs talk to each other so that they're basically sending messages that affect the gene expression. So the last question I have is, what does an organ chip sound like when it's talking to another organ? So I looked at our piece of hardware, and I said to Frank Block, who's building, I said, hey, Frank, you see that barcode? Let's convert that into a keyboard. And see that little vial, and let's convert it into an organ pipe. He says, no problem. So Frank built an organ on a chip. And this is... <laughs> this should work. This is a symphonic organ on a chip conversation. Thank you very much.